every now and again, if I see something great in editing, like a good clip, I'll cut it out and I'll post it on my Twitter and I'll explain why I like the editing. Uh Uh, Nine times out of ten, it's the grammar. It's the grammar that they've created for that purpose, that, that, that the editing serves the story. Hey, welcome. My name is Piotr and this is Cut to Reveal Podcast. And I'm Ricky, and this is where we discuss about the editing art form and all the hurdles of this career path. In today's episode, Peter talks with editor Simon Smith. Yeah, he's most known for his work on the HBO series Chernobyl, but also for Amazon Solos. Ricky, you saw Solos, didn't you? I did. I watched it. Uh, actually, I binged it the other day. It's real short in regards to like it's all 30 second, 30 second. It's 30 minute episodes. But yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, it's Solos, it's just one actor, even if yeah, that yeah, actor's I- in there a couple of times. <laughs> Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Uh, and I mean, like Simon Smith, I think you could definitely say that he's uh, an editor on the rise. You know, we're going to hear about him a lot in the coming years. That, that's what I think. And, you know, uh, we, we discussed his most recent project, Help. Uh, th- and because of that, because he shares like the timeline of Help with me, I think it's best to watch this episode on YouTube. Uh, where where you'll be able to see what we talk about. But even if you just listen, most of it will be like clear enough. Uh, there is this one take in the film, which is like mm-hmm. 20 something minutes long take. And you know, Simon showed, me, show, showed it to me on the timeline and, ter- mm-hmm. and it turns out that there are like, I don't know, 40 cuts in it, which is crazy <laughs> because y- you, when, you, when you watch it, you wouldn't recognize like any of them probably. Maybe it's one or magic. two. magic. Yeah, magic, magic of film. It's magic, yeah. exactly. I mean, okay, actually, these are not cuts. There are also, like, speed rampings and things like that. So these are all the things he, he kind of touches on in the interview. So, yeah. Okay, great. Well, then, let's get let's get into your interview with Simon Smith. Let's do it. Roll the tape. I guess I want to start with a question I really didn't plan for, but uh, actually our conversation about kids like led me to it. How do you balance, you know, working as an editor, uh, I would say high profile editor, with having three kids? How do you do it, man? So I try and keep really strict hours. Like, uh, you know, I'm in the cutting room by nine, but I'm out of the cutting room by six. You know, I don't really stay past six. Mm -hmm. Whenever there is a down day, you know, if we're waiting for notes or, or any opportunity, you know, I will take that opportunity to come in late or go home early, you know, um, so I can do the school run or, or whatever. And then just have time between jobs. Like when we had son, I took like four months off when he was mm-hmm. born. And mm-hmm. then when we had our most recent daughter, I took four months off then, but it turned into a lot more because of the pandemic. But then since October, I've been pretty full on and it doesn't look like it's going to get any easier between now and next <laughs> November. So um, I think I'm managing it OK, but it, it is hard. Yeah, it is hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's a constant struggle, I guess. And the next job that I've got next year, though, is, is working from home. Oh, so, that's cool. I mean, if that works out and actually having said that, I worked from home from October till June this year. So uh, yeah, maybe I got about six months of working from home. I have a, uh, an avid in the in the shed. So it's okay. Mm-hmm. So you, you edited help at home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. So I did uh-huh. the assembly at home. So they were shooting up in a place called Liverpool, a city in the north of England. And I was editing that in my shed at home. Yeah. And I edited a series called Solos for Amazon. That was all from home. Uh, the, the, the guys um, I was working with were in uh, Los Angeles and uh-huh. then next year I'm pretty certain we're going to be at home again for the whole of, of that job uh, because uh-huh. Uh-huh. they're uh-huh. shooting in New York or they're shooting in Florida or they're shooting in London uh-huh. and and yeah it means that we get to be at home which you know was probably like one of the only good things to come out of Covid. Yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> How did you actually become an editor? I studied film at university and then I managed to get on a couple of, you know, dramas as a, as a runner, you know, production runner. Mm-hmm. And, and back then, the editors would be on location with everyone because they couldn't just send the media like we do today. So the editors were on location. We were filming in Tunisia, in Africa, a, a series about ancient Rome. And 
And I just would find that the place that I wanted to be was was with the editors. You know, whenever I would take lunches around to all the departments and I took lunch to the editors, I was like, ah, oh, this is this is the place that I you know, I gravitate towards. And I became friends with those editors. And then, you know, eventually those editors took me on as, as a trainee, as an assistant, and then I just worked my way up. So it, it was really through getting that production experience on a drama and seeing that that, that was the job that I, you know, liked the most. Mm-hmm. You resonated with it, get it. Oh, totally, yeah. Because <laughs> for me, it's like, um, I was on set a lot, but on set, you had to wait like, half an hour 45 minutes to see anything happen uh-huh. whereas in an edit suite yeah, right. you you can like iterate and make something happen instantly right and that a level of iteration and level of creativity and, and level of like being able to try stuff is how my brain works i get far too impatient on a on a set mm-hmm. and it all takes so long uh i was on a on set for a a, a, a werewolf film called the wolf man It was a night shoot and they said to me, oh, you really want to be like on set for this big stunt. So I got on set for the big stunt. I was, you know, a, a production runner. They yell action and the guy like smashes a window and then he jumps and this cable like lowers him down onto the ground. And then they went cut and that was it. Right. So he just got lowered <laughs> down with a cable from the top of a building onto the ground. And then it took like 45 minutes before they could do that again. And I was like, oh, that, that's, that's such a like long time to... To do anything, whereas yeah, in the edit suite we, you know, we change things all the time. So I yeah. much prefer it. <laughs> yeah, get it. Okay, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, your recent uh, film, Help. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I feel like there are quite a lot of films about pandemic that came out okay. last year. So I guess my question is, what makes Help unique in your eyes? Uh, I guess I should preface it with explaining to people what Help is, because Help has come out in the UK. But I don't know that it's going to get distribution anywhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, Help is a like 90 minute TV movie starring uh, Jodie Comer, who was uh, famous for the HBO series Killing Eve. I think it's HBO. And a guy called Stephen Graham, who is a very famous actor in England, but he's also been in lots of Martin Scorsese's films. Yeah. Um, you know, he's a real treasure for us. Incredible actor. And it's written by a writer called Jack Thorne, who's, um, you know, quite a big writer here in the UK. Jodie plays a young girl who gets a job at a care home. And Stephen plays a um, guy in his 40s who is a resident of the care home who has like early onset Alzheimer's. They, you know, have a friendship. And then the pandemic hits. And it's her trying to look after him through the pandemic. Um, Now, prior to this... The last thing I wanted to do was work on a film about the pandemic. The last thing I wanted to watch was a film about the pandemic. You know, I was um, as fatigued by it and sick of it as as the whole world, I think. You know, it's the thing that you kind of would avoid that, that job if it comes in. But um, this was, you know, written by Jack Thorne and starred... Jodie and Stephen and, and directed by Mark Munden and when those people are involved in something you know that actually you know it's going to be good I've worked with you know Mark an awful lot and I've worked with Jack on a couple of things now so suddenly I was like okay you know I, I, I'm I, I'd love to do this I'm very interested in this and it's to us it's a very important film because it is supposed to shine a light on the disgraceful treatment of care homes during the pandemic. I mean, care homes, the majority of deaths uh, in England in, in large periods of the pandemic were happening in care homes where the policy was even to send people out of hospital into care homes who hadn't been tested, you know. So they were literally like sending COVID into care homes where there's old people and then... A care home would have an outbreak and everyone in the care home would die, you know. So this was really us feeling that we needed to tell that story on behalf of care workers and on behalf of the people that that died. So it was important to us to, you know, make it. I mean, the, the way our government dealt with it, uh, I think is awful. But I think the film exists in a... Um, neutral ground to, to some extent it, it it just tries to show what happened it, like mm-hmm. 
we did have versions of the film where we could have, you know, been a lot more, um, you know, one-sided, but we tried to not do that. Oh, and we, we, even in the edit, you know, we had edits of the film where it was very one-sided and then we were like, okay, let's, let's make sure that this is balanced back out. I took it on because of the people that I got to work with, you know, Mark, Mark and Jack, but we made it because we felt it was important. Does that answer your question? I, I don't know if I've even uh, answered your question. It yeah, it yeah. Does. Okay, cool. It does. It does <laughs> can I, can I uh, actually, though, um, it, it, what is um, very relevant, which, you know, wouldn't come out. Um, so the director of the film was a guy called Mark Munden. Yeah. Now, very early in my career, I was an assistant editor on yeah. a TV series that Mark directed. Yeah. And then a few Utopia. years later... Yeah, Utopia. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, Utopia, I was the assistant editor and Mark directed that. And then uh, Utopia Series 2, I was the assembly editor. And then on National Treasure, Mark uh, had me, you know, promoted up to editor. So I got to do an episode with Mark on, on National Treasure. And then we did, um, I did an episode of Electric Dreams with him, with uh, Steve Buscemi in it. And then I did a series called The Third Day with Jude Law in it, with Mark. So... That this is one director, and actually there's another editor that he used to work with, or he still works with, called Luke, and I was like Luke's assistant through a lot of this. So mm-hmm. Mark and Luke were instrumental and, and took me under their wing and taught me everything that I really you know, know and love about what I do. And that relationship now, uh, that's been you know, probably 10 years almost, maybe eight years of, of, of working with the same people. So when you know, Mark or, or Luke calls me up, you know, I definitely want to be involved in anything they're doing. That's it. Yeah. I love it. Like, I mean, that, that, that's what it's about, about people you work with. And actually, it yeah. leads me to the question I wanted to ask uh, later, but I ask it right yeah, away. Yeah. Uh, how do you develop that long-lasting relationship with a director? I mean, there's a few directors that I've worked with, and they're all, all directors that I've worked with have been completely different. You know, they do things very differently, um, even to the approach that they have to the edit. Um, Mark, who I worked with on Help, he's someone who is in the edit with you every day from nine till six and, and, and you're just working every day and, and you're looking at stuff together. Like he sits next to me and we look at stuff together like it, it, and we bounce these ideas backwards and forwards and we discuss it backwards and forwards. Other directors, you know, I might not see for days and days. They might give me notes, leave me to it and then I send them a cut. But Mark is, you know, is is someone who I'm absolutely in awe of with his work and we have very similar tastes. We went to see a film together uh, last week and it's funny because we went with a group of people <laughs> and so many of the group, you know, they, they kind of liked it, but me and Mark, we absolutely loved it. Like it, for, for, for me, I was like, oh, it's the best. And Mark was like, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's so good. And like everyone else was like, yeah, it's okay. Uh, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. It's called The Nest by a director called Sean Durkin, I think. It's, the editing in that is incredible. Like, uh, if, if anyone wants to have a real edit treat, they should watch the film The Nest. Roger that. Uh, th- 2020. Yeah. Okay. I, I yeah, yeah. It's so good. And I, I, so good that I saw it twice in like two weeks in the cinema. So the, so the director, Mark, we both come out of that and we both love it. And I think that we've really struck a, a, a similar taste for films. Obviously, you know, Mark has um, a, a much bigger uh, library of, of stuff that he's watched and knows. And, and he just feeds this stuff to me all the time. Like when we were working on Help, <laughs> he would say, oh, have you seen this film? You have to see this film. And, and I would literally, on the train on the way to work, the next day I'd watch the film. Um, I have quite a long train ride to get in and out of, of London. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, it's just constant feeding of, of films to watch. I will check this out, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. I mean, you, you have to have a lot of trust between one another to, to be able to work uh, side by side like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, you know, and um, a lot of uh, uh, taste similarities with mm-hmm. I suppose as well with Mark it's got to the point now we edited help very quickly I think as an assistant editor I've been trained for many years on exactly how to do it to get what he's trying to do you know mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. and our process fits together very very well now so we're mm-hmm. very efficient 
we get there very quickly and then we get to do interesting things. I mean, help is for me one of the most uh, interesting edits and projects, you know, I've I've been able to do and and I think I'll get to do for a while. Like it it really did let me explore an edit style and an approach that that I hadn't explored before and yeah, mm-hmm. it's, it's so like satisfying and, and, and fulfilling and great yeah. to be part of. Yeah, actually, you, you have this one take shot in the film. Yeah. I don't know how long is that, but it's like 20, 25, 30 minutes. I don't know, but it's very long. Yeah. Actually, I have prepared a little bit for you. Here, my edit from help. So yeah. I can zoom out and I can go to the beginning of that scene. We called it the long night. It's like the, mm-hmm. the, the first mm-hmm. night where she's kind of left on her own. And that long take starts here. Yeah. And it goes and like if if I go like this. So that's the that's the duration of the film. So it starts, you know, about Yeah, it's like 40, 40 minutes 40, in. Yeah, 40 minutes in. Yeah. And it goes until So what's that? That's 20 23 uh minutes 40. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is played as one uh shot, one take. It was shot over a few days. I think there's about 11 uh, shots in there. So there's about 11 shots that kind of make it up. If you look at my timeline here, that grey pit part is the timeline. You can see how many cuts I've got in that, you know, one take. And there's so much that we're doing during that one take. There's something that Mark and I do a lot, which is we take control of time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can zoom in here and you can see that it plays for a bit at, at regular speed. And then in this bit, it's 125% speed. And then it goes back mm-hmm. down to regular speed then up to 120, 110. All times we are controlling the rhythm and the pace and the, and the, and the timing of it. And then elsewhere, like uh, here, for instance, this layer on V2 is a whole... Um, reframing layer so we are directed we, we are reframing and directing where we want the camera to be and where we want people to be looking even though it's one take I spent as long on each minute of this as I did on any other minute of the film mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right the the sound mm-hmm. design you know we, we we have in here on this layer uh, A8 we have the phone call that she makes to the NHS 111 and, you know, we've manipulated and, and controlled all of that so that the audio in that call kind of comes in and out and the sound design like really swirls to keep you to create the the effect that we want, really. Even though, it, you know, editors and, and people that don't know might look at this and think, oh, what did he do for those few days? You know, <laughs> um, there's there's an awful lot of work that's gone into that that 23 minutes you know yeah yeah i i have actually noticed a few actually honestly just one but but i i have noticed one time remapping in between just watching oh did you oh cool interesting you you have an eye for it yeah so you know so you know what you're looking for i think the general lay viewer no way they 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 wouldn't they wouldn't (laughs) spot it yeah it's 11 11 different shots so you're merging the, the 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 shots on the on the dark parts where you're moving to the corridor and things like that? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes we're doing that. Mm-hmm. Or we are... Like, we've got one really clever one where as she wipes across, we, like, roto round her and then mm. the wipe creates the wipe into the other take. Um, yeah, move, movement, wipes. Here's my favourite one, right? And this is, this is absolutely incredible that this worked. Mm-hmm. Um... So here, for this moment, they like they try and turn over um, this man Kenny, and down here we see his arm hanging. And this mm-hmm. image of this arm was so powerful to us when we watched it, but it's only yeah. in one take, um, and it feels like you know like very painterly in, in its in its blurriness. So either side of that arm, so we have a cut there. Between that take and that take. Mm-hmm. And then we have a cut here between this take and this take. So the, the, the arm is just a separate... The arm is from take five 
and the bit before the arm is from take seven and the bit after the arm is from take seven. You know, oh. we were so keen on having that arm that we even found a way to cut that arm in and then and then cut that arm out. So yeah, so that's how we get to, <laughs> you know, the amount of cuts in it that we have. No, I, I wouldn't spot this one even if I would like watch it frame by frame. And and, and actually like I don't want people to think it is edited, you know. I, like yeah, exactly. the, the, the the design is that you're meant to feel so connected to this real time event that's happening that the editing is meant to disappear. You know, the quality of this editing for me comes down to you not being able to see it. And I think um, you did a great job with it because actually when I watched it for the first time, because I've seen the film twice, but when oh, okay. I watched it for the first time, I was like 10 minutes in, I think I was like, wait, is it still one take? <laughs> yeah, so I wasn't yeah. sure. I wasn't sure. And then I was like, you know, conscious about it. But at first I, I didn't like grasp it that it's, it's yeah. still one take. Yeah. I, I would say we also had one of my favorite and best DOP cinematographers working on it. I've, a guy called Mark uh, Wolf, who mm-hmm. I've been lucky enough to work with for like 15 years on different projects. He's absolutely one of the best um, Uh, especially self-operating. He operated all of this mm-hmm. himself. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew even before the project started just how great he was at operating and, and as, a, as a cinematographer, DOP. I think that, so they did shoot it over two days. So, it, it, you know, there was, there was a, a point when it's day one and a point when it's day two, but he would do a lot of that in, in one go, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it is a dance. It's a dance that he's doing with the sound guys and with... Um, Jody and with Stephen and and, oh, yeah. and you know everyone involved. So I'd say that I'm already in a great place when I'm you know able to just take his work and and try and elevate that. You know he 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 is incredible and his his operating on that scene, his cinematography on that that long scene is you know some of the best I'll ever get to watch or or, or mm-hmm. work with. You know. Thinking about that one take shot, it reminded me of uh, 1917. Have you seen the film? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And I, I and I've seen like uh, I don't know, I don't know, was it Oscars or something like that? And Sam Mendes, uh, he said uh, on stage, he said that Lee Smith was instrumental to to to, to yeah, how course, the film yeah. came out. And you know, and, and 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 he, I think he got a question later, like. What did he really do? <laughs> like it's, it's one take, and, and he just explained, "Oh, you you have no idea. You have no idea <laughs> how many yeah. work is involved in into creating that experience." <laughs> I spent as much time, minute for minute. Yeah, we spent as much time on those twenty three minutes as any other twenty three minutes. Yeah. we're doing a lot of a lot of sound work on there. Um, we're doing a lot of this time remapping. I, I do time remapping all the time. I mean, the script, it is broken down into a few scenes, like the bit in the bedroom, the bit in the hallway, mm-hmm. the bit, you know, there's actually two scenes that used to exist in it that we cut out. You know, there, mm-hmm. there, there were bit, there were dog legs where she, there was a dog leg where she went to see one of the other characters and she hung out with mm-hmm. the other character and then came back and carried on. And we were like, oh, this, this other character dog leg is just slowing it mm-hmm. down. Let's just mm-hmm. find a way to not do that. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I mean, I don't think they cut any scenes out of 1917, but we cut we cut two scenes out of that that little um, yeah. uh, 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 set piece. Yeah, and, and, and we still have no idea. <laughs> yeah, as, exactly. as a viewer, and, yeah, and that's the that's the hope. That's the hope yeah. that you have no idea. That's great. And actually, mm-hmm. I have noticed that you have a lot of unconventional tight coverage for for the film. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Which is which is lovely, which is lovely, uh, and it's like I I would say that it's kind of brave to to shot it like this. So it's uh, heads off to to Mark. Uh, yeah. For for. I mean, I can probably I can the, probably f- the camera this way. I can probably find a couple of those um, those scenes for you. Um, so like, there's this great scene here. Mm-hmm. Um, can yeah. you can you see this? You can you can yeah, see can. this on your screen. So like yeah, this, we're so close to you know Jodie's face for this and and her father's face for this. And I reckon if I open up the bin, so that's scene one o four. If I open up scene one o four, um, it's probably. Um, Yeah, mostly mm-hmm. is is is. Can you still see this? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I can. 
all of these top ones are all the tight yeah. coverage shots that cover her face. And then we maybe had, we had some more tight ones down here, the second half of the scene, this one and this one. But then we had like, you know, one, this is one slate, slate 49. Uh, slate 49 was a wide one. Slate 48 was a wide one. And slate 51 was a wide one. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, 46, 47, you know, 50, 52, they were all close on the face. I, I mean, I, I love it. And it, and it's it's the kind of film that I think um, the grammar of how they shot it, uh, it, it was important to be that close to people and to, mm -hmm. you know, to really feel that from people. I, I, I love that, um, that Mark, uh, as a director, and, and, you know, his DOP that he worked with, um, also Mark, and, and then me as an editor, that he does try and create a a grammar so yeah those tight shots maybe could not exist in other films you couldn't just take that scene and dump it in another film with the the right the correct characters and it would work it wouldn't mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. he establishes this particular style based on the film that he's making similarly you know i mentioned the nest if you go and watch the nest the the scenes in that you could not put one of those scenes into this film it just would feel completely out of place mm -hmm. but they it's it's about establishing your own grammar and style and ideally doing that at the head of the film so that and doing it slowly so that an audience can you know uh, understand or, or come along and learn what that grammar and that style is and then you can go you know deeper and further with it um as the film progresses Love it. I have actually noticed it, not watching the film, that I'm being like taught the language of a film minute by minute. Because yeah, Because at right. first I was like, oh, already, we are already in close-ups. <laughs> and then I kind of like got into it, as you said. Oh, I love that. The way, the way that you said the, the, that you were taught it. And yeah, and even the, the being taught and, and the word language, that I, I think that is something that on a project like this, mm -hmm. um, that I, I, I get to play with you know you get to slowly introduce techniques to the audience that that they can then you know sink into and and in, in other series it might be the way that you do a flashback or in other series it might do the way that you internalize someone's you know inner self or something like that or yeah. you know the use of montage and and, and so on and um, in you know a few years ago i did a, a, a series called chernobyl and in chernobyl it was very much about the experience and the point of view of the people that were going through it so a lot of what we were editing was edited from a point of view it, so it then for the audience it allowed it to be much more experiential in that way in this the the the, the grammar we're going for is those very you know raw close-ups that that almost force you to confront the the story or the issue that we're trying to you know confront you with and and at the end of help, you know, we go for that down the barrel of the lens, you know, solo speech from Jodie Como, which kind of sums up everything that we've been saying throughout the film. Um, and, you know, I think that that really pays off because of everything that you've been taught, the whole language that you've been soaked in for the, for the hour and a half beforehand. Yeah, yeah. The, the ending is powerful. Her monologue is powerful. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's really good. Ed Actually, one note. <laughs> I need to admit that that, that Liverpool Paul yeah. accent was so difficult for me to, to understand. That's the reason I need to, I needed to see this, the film for the second time because, like, <laughs> sometimes it was just super difficult for me to understand. I'm impressed that you watched it twice. Very impressed that you watched it twice. It is. Um, I I mean, I struggled. We luckily we had an assistant editor, or assembly editor, Ross, who. Um, is from that part of the UK. So he did a lot of translating for us. Um, and uh, it's quite... Uh, when it went out on TV in the UK, quite a few of the subtitles were wrong because the person, I guess, who <laughs> captioned them, or, or either the person or the automatic... Okay, um, the automatic, like, computer... <laughs> yeah, it, it gave them the wrong captions. So there's, there's one line... There's one line where, he's, where he calls... Um, Stephen's character calls... Jodie's character, a, a soft twat. He's like, you soft twat. Twat is not a nice word in England. It's, a, it's an insult. Yeah. But it's, a, you know, he, he's saying it in a, in a friendly way. 
that the, the subtitle came up, you soft tomato. Um, <laughs> uh, and maybe, maybe soft tomato is, is a better, is a better uh, insult. You know, to call someone a soft tomato is, is probably quite appropriate. But it was just, you know, the, the way that they had the, the, my TV had the live, you know, auto captioning feature on it. Mm. So we need to we need to wait for the Blu-ray edition that will have the proper subtitles, maybe even in Polish, and then uh, and then you can understand what on earth they were saying. Yeah. By the way, uh, is Stephen and uh, Judy uh, do they talk this way? Is it the way this? Yeah, way? yeah. Or, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're from Liverpool. They're from Liverpool. Now, Jodie right. Comer, she's in a film called Free Guy with Ryan Reynolds at the moment, a big Hollywood film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, she is like queen of accents. You type in Jodie Comer accents onto YouTube mm -hmm. and you can see, and she was, she was in Killing Eve, you know, she, she was lead character in Killing Eve. And in that, she has all these like accents that she's putting on. She never speaks in her natural accent. And, mm -hmm. you know, she'll talk about it. She'll say that she's never actually done a film before really where she's, been able to be her natural accent she's always played other people so oh. this was a film that was very special to her and Stephen because it was going back to the, the you know the city where they're both like really from and, and being able to use their own accents okay that's great yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, one last question I guess about help we've talked about this last monologue like it's the second to last actually scene and I, I've noticed that you used the jump cut in that one for 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 the last line 15 years ago, it would be treated as a mistake. I'm sure you made this, this choice to, to use the jump cut just because of the emotion, to convey the emotion. You don't know what we cut out. Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't. <laughs> so we, 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 we cut something out. So that's what we did. We cut something out. So that, that's why that jump cut is in there. Um, I, I, can, I can actually show um, people watching this um, the exact cut that you're referring to. So it's... She's doing her speech, she's doing her speech, she's doing her speech. We've got a little speed up there. She's doing her speech. And then I think it's there. There's a, is that the one that you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, it is. It is. It is. So there's exactly. a tiny, there's a tiny jump cut somewhere in, in here. Uh, is it going to play? Oh no, it's playing very slowly. But I don't think I don't think the majority of audiences would notice that there's a, mm -hmm. a jump cut in there, mm -hmm. and we've tried to put it in a place where it's not really noticed. Um, it's not different takes. It's just we we wanted to nip out mm -hmm. a couple of lines. So there was a couple of lines mm -hmm. that she said in. Well, the speech is quite long anyway. The the the, the monologue. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's mm -hmm. you know, it's her just in the car looking down the lens mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. Almost two min mm -hmm. uh, one one minute forty. So we we there there were some bits in it that um, were, were more than what was needed. And actually, in this slightly cut form, we felt that this better told what we wanted to tell as a story. Mm -hmm. So we we removed those lines and we tried to hide a cut. But from editors like yourself, we were not successful in hiding the cut. But we tried to hide a cut in there. It did work for me. It, it, it didn't feel as a jump cut to me. That's what I mean. By removing those lines of dialogue, we felt that the overall product mm -hmm. was better. Mm -hmm. uh, we felt that we did it in such a place that we could, um, you know, get away with it. I and mean, it wouldn't yeah. pull the audience out of what was mm -hmm. going on. That is why it happened. And and yeah, as, as I say, to, to achieve that, we're We're doing a few things where like, uh, I don't know if I can see. Yeah. So like, you know, we're cutting around her and, you know, company in the background slightly differently. And then as it, as it moves across, it kind of fades in the background and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so it's, you know, there's a bit of a, mm -hmm. a bit of a, a technique going on there. And then look, on the top layer, layer three, we're actually doing a whole different, um, zoom and, and, and pan. So, on the day it looked like let me see if i can find the button that one so yeah so on the day we were we were at this kind of zoom level on the rushes whereas yeah. uh, in the finished film we're at this zoom level you know we've gone much much further in i mean the difference between that and that is quite substantial oh, yeah. yeah you know yeah medium shop to a close-up here yeah. oh completely completely and and when you watch it as an audience you're in this close up you're completely mm. in this close up yeah. so we've kind of you know manipulated and manufactured that it did go into a close up like it got to that far in in the yeah. mm -hmm. but but we ended up cutting out much mm -hmm. much earlier and still wanting to maintain that that same push in 
in, in in the edit for for myself and for Mark, you know, anything is up for grabs and any anything can be changed. Um, there's lots of times when like, you know, I'll use half the screen will be from take one and the other half might be from take four, you know, like like literally split the screen down the middle so that the two characters are, are maybe, you know, performing from different different takes. We spend a lot of time getting it to the perfect place that we're trying to get it to. You know, I'm super proud of this film and super privileged to have, to have worked on it. You should be, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thanks, man. I mean, I hope, uh, yeah, I, I do hope that people get to see it. Totally. By the way, you, you've been the second unit director for that one. How did you end up doing that? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so I, I, I've done second unit directing for, for Mark Munden on a few of his projects. Ah, okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I did a bit on Utopia, a bit on National Treasure, a bit on The Third Day. Um, I'll be honest, on this okay. one... There's just three shots. There's only three <laughs> shots in the entire in the entire hour and a half. There's only three shots that I directed. What happens, I think, with Mark a lot is he knows that, like, if he schedules a couple of days for second unit, that I can come up and do those, and I can mm-hmm. get a lot of things that maybe he hasn't had time to get or that he wanted mm-hmm. to try, and like, it's just quite a lot to do with a main unit and stuff like that. It's not like I only shot, I shot a lot more than this, but the, yeah, the only shots yeah, that, that, that made it in were, were these three. Um, but then it was really, you know, really nice when, when this came out to see in the credits. Oh, oh I've, got, I've got that that credit as well. That's very nice. It's just, you know, I, I think as an editor, you kind of can clue into the style and, and it was a, you know, lovely excuse to go to the set and visit the set and visit Mark and, and, and everyone. So, yeah. Yeah, I've also watched Welcome to Romford. Uh, oh right! Uh, oh, that's kind of you. Oh, very good of you. Uh, did you understand any of those accents? No. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, it was it was easier to understand. Oh okay. Um, so yeah, so maybe like what uh, twelve, ten, twelve years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I directed a, a half hour thing for um uh, for the same channel for Channel Four, which which okay. uh, commissioned help, um, and it was a documentary set in some taxi cabs in in a part of England where I'm from uh, called Romford um, and it was kind of an experimental documentary film but yeah I did a bit of, I did a bit of directing like so I directed that I directed a travel comedy show with a comedian um, called Carl Pilkington who you know I'm a big fan of here in the UK uh, I did another comedy travel show around Scotland with a, a comedian called Sean Walsh who's great I did the series Chernobyl, which was a year in in the cutting room. And then as soon as I finished that, I didn't want to be anywhere near the cutting room. So I went and directed a a small like theatre play um, in in like a small experimental theatre thing. So I try and, Uh yeah, I try and, you know, mix things up. Like I, I do love the edit. The the edit is my favourite place to be, but I like to play with these other other jobs when I can. So uh, we can expect that you will direct something else in the future. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I'm doing. I am doing something at the moment. So I am shooting something at the moment, oh. um, which should be out. Um, I guess in like January, February. Uh, yeah. So anyone who I don't know looks at my Twitter or my website or my YouTube or something, I'm sure come January, February, there'll be some some stuff on there about about that i just i just like to you know mix things up i get bored if i just do the same thing mm-hmm. okay lovely uh and yeah the question the question i need to ask <laughs> how did you land the job on chernobyl how did you do it so um luke dunkley who i mentioned earlier i was his assistant on utopia he taught me pretty much how to do the job and he, you know, he's a, a really great friend. I saw him last night for a drink and um, one of the, you know, best editors going. Um, he edited a series for uh, Johan Renk, the director, uh, called The Last Panthers. And then Johan uh, asked him to do Chernobyl. And he was actually working with Mark, uh, who directed help on a film with Mark. Uh, so he wasn't available to do Chernobyl. So he very kindly said to Johan, you should, you should meet Simon. So not only do, you know, I owe these guys so much for teaching me everything I know mm-hmm. about the craft, but, you know, also for a lot of the breaks that I've, I've been given. So, yeah, you know, those, those relationships 
specifically with with Mark uh, Munden and Luke Dunkley, uh, like changed my life multiple times. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's how I that's how I got the job on Chernobyl, um, and then I just every day tried not to mess it up. Yeah, <laughs> do, yeah do, you know, yeah. do them do them proud, do them proud. So, yeah, how, how did it feel to work on you know one of the best miniseries ever in my opinion? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I kind of thought it was when I read the scripts I thought this is one of the best mm. things ever yeah. Uh, yeah every day when we were shooting I think this is one of the best things ever you know I always loved it but just because I love it doesn't necessarily mean it will translate to you know lots and lots and lots of viewers right yeah I I try and or I've been very lucky to have worked on a lot of things that I like to watch You know, mm-hmm. so I'd say that the majority of the things that I've worked on are perfect for me. Like, like I would, you know, I would love to watch them. Mm-hmm. It just so happened that Chernobyl turned out to be perfect for a lot of people. I don't, we, I don't know why. You know, mm-hmm. we got, we got, we hit a right beat with people, and then that level of success of something has opened, you know, so many doors. The the things that I'm working on now, the things that I'm working on next year. The, the you know my career for the next five ten years will probably be the reward for the success of Chernobyl you know and, and I'm mm-hmm. hugely grateful to to Johan Renk and to Craig Mazin and and you know uh, Jane Featherstone and you know and, and Carolyn and, and so on who were were the people in in charge of that series and and who who gave me the job you know and and mm-hmm. actually uh, you know Zana the producer on that I'm, I'm working with her again right now so. Um, again, like hopefully those people are going to be people that I will continue to work with. Mm-hmm. The success of it would take anyone by surprise. Like no mm-hmm. one would predict. And and you can't like it, we got very lucky. Just it, it hit at the right time, and you know I think it's an, a, an incredible piece of work. But it, it yeah. hit, which was good. We caught that wave. Was it just uh, Johan uh, that that you worked with on, on these episodes, or uh, did you work with uh, Craig Mazin uh, as well in the cutting room? The DGA, the Directors Guild of America, has it so mm-hmm, that the directors yeah. get a certain amount of time. They get the first mm-hmm. pass. So Johan got his first pass with us on all the episodes, and then I think Johan was also like, you know, um, I'm not sure if he was an executive producer, but but he was. Uh, you know, it was it was his series. He was directing the series. It wasn't like he was just doing one episode. Yeah. But we did also after we'd, you know, spent many weeks with Johan. Then like also Craig uh, came in and Craig had a go at all the episodes and had a look at all the episodes and and you know explored it with us as well. And then we'd all get together and and you know it would be Craig and Johan and 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 Carolyn and Jane and Sana um, notes and 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 ideas and. You know, you'd watch the episode through together, and then you just all talk about yeah. it. So yeah, it was it was a hugely like collaborative piece. I think you know, Yoan and, and Craig are, are you know two of the most um, amazing people to work for like, in the world. Really, like I got yeah, got very lucky working with both of them. And I think you know, I hope to um, you know work with them both on on future things. Craig's doing uh, the series The Last of Us for HBO. Uh, at the oh. moment, you know, which is very, very exciting. Amazing, yeah. amazing. I, I, I've listened to the podcast he did uh, about Chernobyl, uh, oh, cool. which is like amazing. Like, <laughs> do you do you know that he's got another podcast? No, I don't. No, I oh don't. my god. Well, uh, um, the Craig Mazin, the the writer of Chernobyl, and and now the writer and showrunner of of The Last of Us, he has a, a weekly podcast which he's been doing for five hundred episodes. Um, no called way. Script, yeah yeah it's called um it's called script notes and it's about how okay. to write scripts and i actually listened to that before i worked on chernobyl yeah yeah so script script notes I podcast i heard about this podcast i just didn't know it's him okay yeah I it's craig mason yeah yeah oh um and you you've got 500 episodes yeah. to catch up on there <laughs> yes yeah, <exactly>. definitely <laughs> exactly <laughs> they're good they're good I've, i've probably listened to i've probably listened to about 200 i reckon <laughs> yeah yeah they're good that's great that's great from the workflow point of view i wanted to ask you how, how do you usually work on scenes do you work on individual scenes first uh, and then you assembly them together or h- how do you work from that point of view well on 
the dramas that I work on, you work, mm-hmm. uh, you keep up to the camera. So whatever they shoot today, I edit mm-hmm. the following day. And they don't often shoot them in order. So if they shot scenes 5, 25 and 30 yesterday, then I edit scenes 5, 25 and 30. And then as mm-hmm. scenes come in, I keep editing. And then when I get a string of scenes, I put them together and, you know, check that they mm-hmm. work. So I, I tend to edit, I, I edit what they shoot. Mm-hmm. straight as they shoot it and that's that's mm-hmm. pretty normal for all tv and film um i've never worked on anything where they shot it chronologic like like script order so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you all you would always work on the on the individual scene so it, it really is keeping up to the camera and and, and doing it as they shoot it I, I wanted to ask you also about what do you consider to be like the most important qualities of of editors of great editors I think, like going back to kind of where we started, I think a good edited piece, a good edited film or TV, creates a, a grammar and a language, and a, is unique to unique and purposed to the film that it's for. You know, so you, your your editing becomes unique for that film to suit perfectly that film, and if an editor is doing that then that's, you know, what I'm looking for. I'll give myself a little plug now on, on my on my okay. Twitter feed. Every now and again, if I see something great in editing, like a good clip, I'll cut it out and I'll post it on my Twitter and I'll explain why I like the editing. Okay. And uh, nine times out of ten, it's, um, it's the grammar. It's the grammar that they've created um, for that purpose, that, that, that the editing serves the story. How do, Simon, how do you stay focused as an editor? I'm sure you struggle with distractions or on a daily basis. Um, no, I'm pretty good. Like, I think I'm uh-huh. pretty good at staying focused. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, very efficient. Like, I, 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 you, get your, you get your dailies in, you cut the scene, you just start, you cut the scene, you, you get to six o'clock, you go home. You know, like I, tr- I try and keep a very strict routine. Um, mm-hmm. And I like to go home, you know, I like to go home at six o'clock. So that's, that's how I stay focused because I have the goal of getting out of the cutting room by six. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that goal, you might just like mess around, but I want to be out of that door at six o'clock. Maybe, maybe as I get better at this, I'll be able to leave by five o'clock. That will be the, (laughs) (laughs) that's the, that's, that's that's the ambition. There's a very, I won't name him. I won't name him, but there's a very long-term established famous editor uh, in the UK. And I was talking about how, you know, I'm quite proud to be able to get my work done between nine and six, like nine and six. Mm -hmm. And his assistant turned around to me and she said, nine and six? He's in at 11 and he's out by four. (laughs) You know, like he's so quick (laughs) that he comes in at 11, he leaves by four and he's done it and he's done it all. That's 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 the true that's the true secret. If you can if you can get good enough at what we do that you can be in at 11 and out by 4. There you mm-hmm. go. That's that's foc- that's focus. <laughs> that's amazing focus. That's focus. Oh yeah. I also wanted to ask if you happen to have any favorite filmmaking or editing book. Oh, um yeah, I certainly do. I love the book uh, Art of the Cut which is by an interviewer called Steve Holfish. You know, that book is, is, was like, when that came out, I remember that really like changed my level of excitement for editing because up until then, all other books were about one editor or one editor's guide on how to do stuff, right? So like In the Blink of an Eye um, by Walter Murch is Walter Murch telling you how he edits and how to edit. That's great and, and, and cool. But then when Steve... And Steve had brought out other books before. Steve had brought out, like, uh, guides on how to use Avid software and guides on how to use, I think, grading software. But when he released Art of the Cut, that, feel, that felt like all of this knowledge from, like, 100 editors brought into one place, right? Mm-hmm. It felt mm-hmm. like a celebration of editing. It really felt like a celebration of editing because he's found all these, you know... Um, amazing people who do it so I'd say that Steve's book is probably the 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 one that like makes me feel you know most uh excited and thrilled to like be an editor you know with with Mm -hmm. in 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 a community of of other editors so yeah 
Art of the Cup by Steve Holfish. It's probably on my my bookshelf back there. I'm sure it is. Yeah, I've got this somewhere here as well. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the best. Where can people follow your work? Yeah, on Twitter, I'm just Mr. Simon Smith. So M-R-S-I-M-O-N-S-M-I-T-H. And on there, I keep a, a hashtag, which is my favorite edits. So I think I've got maybe like 100 on there that I've posted okay. over the last few years. And they're, they're little like, you know, two minute clips of my favorite edits. So on there, I'm on mm-hmm. Facebook. I mean, if anyone is on the avid groups on facebook or the editor groups on facebook you can find me on facebook quite easily okay amazing i'm i'm, I'm thrilled that you got to watch help because help i did this year mm-hmm. and help came out just now and actually it was really nice when i walked into work this morning one of the girls who worked on the desk she she said to me um like is your surname smith and i was like yeah yeah that's that's me she knew my name was simon she's like oh <laughs> did you edit help and she just watched help this week and I was like, yeah, yeah, I did edit help. She's like, oh, like, she said, we don't often watch the credits, but when that, that finished, we, we watched the credits because we wanted to see who had edited it and who had worked on it. Um, mm-hmm. So that was, you know, a, re- a really nice, um, you know, thing for me to, to have someone oh, as, yeah. I, as I walk into the office who didn't know, like, say to me, oh, did you edit help? So, Pleasure talking to you. Pleasure talking to thanks you. Thanks so thanks much, man. You're this. great. We'll night. speak again, I'm sure. And there you go, everybody. Simon there you go. Smith. He's, there you go. How, he knows what did his you think shit. About <laughs> I feel like every time we, you got you talk with an editor or a filmmaker, um, I don't want to say breaks the illusion, but it just shows how these people are just like us, you know, like these and like with Simon who has kids and is just trying to like live his life and do the things that he wants to do, and you know, just kind of real down to earth. I love that. I mean, in that in itself is like super inspiring. Where it's just like, well, I'm these guys are just normal people. Francis Parker is a normal person. You know, Jim Cummings is a normal person. And, so, and I'm like, well, I think I'm a normal person too. So I can do. You know, it's it, that stuff is equally as exp- as inspiring as the work that they do. I wouldn't add anything to that. Yeah. Amen. 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 Okay. <laughs> With as many people as you interviewed, like pro editors and filmmakers and stuff, how? Free. Well, three. I mean, I, there's more even you, you, that you interviewed for Cut to the Point. I mean, even clients of yours, I would say, because you've worked with Darius and even... That's right. Sven. We're going to have him, have him on the show, by the way. Yeah, that's, that's going to be awesome. But I mean, how do, how when you talk to them, how does that impact your work? Do you mean like, how do I judge my projects or what we, or, or what, what I learned from these conversations? What do you mean? Yeah, kind of what you learned from these conversations uh, and how you apply whatever you learned, even if it's, you know, from Francis, I learned this. Or even if it's just like, I guess it's at, at the very basics, it's just like, well, I learned this and I thought that was interesting rather than like, I or as far as I picked this up from Jim and this is now how I'm going to look at each project that I work on or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, basically for Jim Cummings, for Francis Parker and Simon Smith, I think like most of the conversations we had are in the podcast, like are in the mm-hmm. episodes, actually, like just the very like few first, uh, first few sentences are cut it out, mm-hmm. where I just like, you know, warm up basically. But uh, other than that, it's a full conversation, or at least close to it. I get like what you get out of it. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I think that like, uh, you know, these conversations are not like tip based. You don't get any specific yeah. tips. So you have mm-hmm. to digest that knowledge to some extent. Yeah. Like, I think like the, the, the big part of learning happens when you're actually not learning, when you're like boring, you're bored basically. And, you know, trying to digest this stuff that you've heard mm-hmm. and hire that subconscious mind to do the job for you. But mm-hmm. there are some takeaways that I get from these conversations that change the way I do things from now mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, the big one from Jim is uh, the way he uh, does writing, basically. He mm-hmm. writes. He, first of all, he writes in an outline form, outline form where he just like uh, basically puts the ideas on the timeline, uh, sorry, onto the script, uh, onto the page. Mm-hmm. And he says these these things out loud, and what sounds right goes on in, goes there. What doesn't sound right goes mm-hmm. out. And uh, later on, only at the very like quite light, late stage in the process, he actually puts it in the script format. You know, so most mm-hmm. of it is just like not in script format at all. 
And then once he has the script format ready, he does a podcast. So basically he, re he records oh, the right. script, mm -hmm. adds sound effects to it, music, mm -hmm. and does everything to make it work in the audio form, you know? And mm. then it's much easier to recognize which parts are needed, which slow down the script and things like that. Mm -hmm. Because like out of a page of, you know, a paper, you, you can't actually recognize these things. What right. looks fine on paper, yeah, quite often doesn't translate to great movie. Um, so yeah, so I think it helps. This is a big tip, and there are a lot of tips that I've learned from um, Darius Breed. We're gonna have him on the show, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So there are a lot of tips because, like, he uh, basically he's so cool that he shares his, I don't know, his ideas and his thoughts with me when yeah. we discuss. Uh, editing of his short films he also mm -hmm. like you know is interested in how um, how the podcast is doing how the channel is doing and he gives me some tips on that so yeah cool. great well that's fantastic cool okay uh i guess it's time to say goodbye <laughs> <laughs> all right so, for now yeah so see you um, in two weeks guys <laughs> yeah see you in a couple weeks and as always shoot and edit like there's no tomorrow Exactly. You got it, Ricky. You got, got it, it right. this time. <laughs>Thanks for taking time out of your busy day. If you like what you've heard, please rate, review, and subscribe on whatever podcast platform you've listened to this on. Your reviews help more people discover this show. You can also follow us on Instagram. Just search for at cut to reveal and tell your friends. And if you have any questions or comments, send them to podcast at cut to the point dot com. And who knows, maybe we'll use them in the future episodes. And as we say around here, until the next time, shoot and edit like there is no tomorrow. Cuts to Reveal podcast is brought to you by The Editing Chef, a course for editors who seek to maximize their creative productivity and streamline the editing workflow. The course introduces tips and techniques that will help you edit more efficiently and therefore make it more enjoyable. Plus, it will delight your clients and keep you passionate about our wonderful profession. The Editing Chef is reopening for new students in December, so if you want to learn more and save your spot, visit cuttothepoint.com forward slash TEC.